I'm Mrs. Vera. Welcome to my show. They were a little bit sort of chaotic to begin with. Anarchy, drag anarchy. That spirit of community that they build is really important for the participants who get to, to be the aliens marching down Market Street. You can't plan when you're dying of AIDS. So you keep a day book. In the day, this is what I'm going to do. We didn't know how long we were gonna live, so we were just desperate to do as much together as possible. I'm gonna take thousands of pictures of one person as long as I can take them. It was my way of saving a life. Interesting to look back over the last 25 years and see uh, the development, uh, particularly in, in the Mrs. Vera costumes. They were a little bit sort of chaotic to begin with, but if you look closely now, they're like couture. It's ridiculous how brilliant they are. I am curious, Robert, how you you met Michael and David. How did you meet them? How did you get involved with this project? Because you're you're a prolific filmmaker, so <laughs> I love that that my wonderful publicist has started using that word. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's take takes forever for my films to come out, but um, but I love doing it, so that's a good thing. The way I met Michael and David was through the previous film that I made, and it's also a, a counterculture story. And someone involved with that is also, he's actually no longer with us, but he wow. was actually involved with David and Michael in the Verisphere, and he would often be in the Pride Parade with them. He mm -hmm. kind of had his own look, Vince C, may he rest. He's a wonderful guy. He said, you need to meet Mrs. Vera. You need to make a film about Mrs. Vera. And I hadn't heard about Mrs. Vera. And, you know, I live in Marin County, so it's it's almost like a different country, even though it's across the Golden Gate Bridge. And so I went to the city one day and I, and I met Michael. And first of all, I was struck by where he lives. You know, he's got this apartment that is just like a, a, a color and pop culture explosion and i just i was smitten right away and then he started showing me pictures pictures of david as mrs vera um in the actual day book mm. and um and i well, just knew treat. yeah i just knew <laughs> that uh, i wanted to tell the story so that's yeah. where it all began I, i'm curious for, for you guys what did you think about being approached to do a film and uh, you know, because this is a very, very personal telling of of everything you've been through. And, and so kind of was there hesitation on your part at all? Did you I mean, you guys are artists, so I imagine you're, you're and you've done film. So it's not like unfamiliar territory to you. But is is was there a certain hesitation because it was so such a personal story you were going to tell? We, we didn't really have a lot of hesitation just because we ascertained right away that Robert was going to tell a really good story and that mm -hmm. all we really had to do is is show up and be ourselves in it. So um, I looked at it as, as, you know, this really fortunate opportunity because, um, I you know, I would never like ask someone to make a film about myself and to have mm -hmm. one to, ha you know, you know, to be central to the, this film was um, incredible. And, you know, we didn't think our story would be told. We were trying to leave a body of photographs as evidence of, of our work. Right. Um, and if, you know, I figured if there was a film made, it would probably be like a student film or, you know, start and stop. But, you know, Robert bought like this, this full cinematic package to, to tell him the story. And all, all we really had to do was um, just be honest and be ourselves in it. So, it, you know, it was great. So for me, um, well, I'm a Leo, so the camera's on, right? So um, <laughs> and I'm, he's an innie. I'm an Audi when it comes to social stuff. <laughs> but um, it was just really an honor that someone was interested. And as a, as a long-term survivor, you know, yeah. my concern was archiving people. And let me put it this way. Like, there was a point in time in the very young days where my mind was thinking, how can I, how can I carry all these memories? How can I have all these people crammed in my head, you know? Mm -hmm. And the only way I could really move through it was to be creative and connect with people. 
But to have someone come in and do the short, first of all, Fear of Sphere, a love story in costume, which is really, when we met, what I loved about talking to Robert as I was showing my daybook pictures was, uh, I said to David, I said, well, he said he sees it as a love story. And that was it, that sealed the deal. And yeah. it was great, you know, from an archival perspective, from our, our relationship perspective, and for, you know, because we're so collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really documents that as well and you know like i wanted the, the work to be to be shown and shared but i i never would have like pitched to someone oh would you make a movie about our love story it just mm. would never you know it would never occur to me but that's what robert saw right away and you know i think it was a really good insight Hence was it was it born from the short film experience for you robert did you feel like when you when you did that when you did the very spirit that you were kind of you know, I had to explore this further, or did you always kind of have that design that you kind of were thinking about how much more can I tell about this story? Well, we were making the short and um, I love the short because it focused just on the costumes and the group effort mm -hmm. of uh, Verisphere and the right. parade. And it really stands on its own in that way. Lovely. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a lovely little film. But as I got to know Michael and David, I, I found this bigger story and I yeah. always wanted to tell it. And I, you know, these poor guys are tired of hearing me say it, but I, I had this young crew, you know, there are these, and you know, my crew is two people besides me. And they're these young little heterosexual guys that love telling my queer stories with me. They just persevered through the four years it took for me to make my previous film because we were doing other things at the same time. And they're yeah. like, oh, please, please don't do a feature just now. Please let us <laughs> finish your film and, and take it to festivals. And, and I was like, okay, but we're going to make a feature out of it after that. <laughs> and when we got time to make the feature, I really, you know, um, kind of crashed their world and said, you can't use any of the footage from the short. They, they need to be com two completely separate films. Otherwise, it's just going to look like an extended short. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I want it to stand alone, and it does. Yeah. So we were able, because um, I had a little relationship with um, local PBS station, when everybody was sheltered during Pride Month, we were able to show... A, a shorter version, a 56 minute version of what we called the um, Mrs. Vera's day book. And that's why when we got back to shoot, David finished the mural and we put in the little COVID section about how they got through it. We added the unabridged. I just think the decision to, to end with COVID made the film so um, poignant. Um, yeah. Kind of like recapitulate what, I mean, it's basically about our history with a previous Epi epidemic yeah. pandemic yeah. and now um you know which was very targeted in its demographic and now we're going through this another huge one um that can affect anyone so i think the film captured how sobering that moment really is for us as a culture the the fascinating thing for me about watching this journey unfold is the interesting kind of dichotomy of we've come so far but we haven't come far enough and every time that we get to a place where we get further, it kind of knocks us back. A little. And you guys live that. I'm kind of curious from your perspective how how you feel like uh, time has helped and and kind of where you're at at this point in your lives. Well, the thing I noticed about COVID, and I used to say it because I mean I lived through all the stuff where they wanted to quarantine people with AIDS and, and yeah, all this all this horrible stuff going on yeah. because of the disease. But this one, man, well, they wouldn't even mention AIDS for years and years and years. Yeah. Say the word. But, you know, fast forward to now, we have this massive thing that is in a lot of ways far worse and quick killer. And I feel like it's been swept away. Like, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that was that. That was last week's TV Guide episode, you know? Yeah. There's been a lot of, um, you know, I think a lot of stuff has been distorted by our weird media milieu in, in this in this country and yeah in general like the amount of acceptance that uh, i feel now compared to when i was young is you know it's i think it's gotten way better and yeah. i think you know the things like science the things that, that, that people complain about are actually like you know making big advances and 
and the, the level of acceptance, I think, you know, is, is so much greater, but it's so vocal, the opposite, you know, it's just, it's really, it's really tough to think we have to like relitigate all these battles with this minority of people. Yeah, which, that's where we're at. Which is as if the politics and the policies are the disease. Robert, with documentaries, and you know this probably all too well, and you you've actually kind of touched on it already. The idea of you had a you had a plan going in, you had an idea of what you wanted to do. Especially having done the short, I would imagine you had it probably even more of a of a deeper plan. But was there something in here beyond the COVID aspect of it? that you didn't expect or was that it well you you way overestimate me by saying that i had a plan going in because <laughs> I, I really never do and okay you know, well that's a great way to approach it though well absolutely I, yeah. I you know i i heard a producer say one time and i completely agree that if the hair on the back of my neck stands up it's the right project yeah nice. and um I got that, I got that special feeling and I knew by just looking at the living spaces of David and Michael and uh, the generous nature that they had and the photographs that I wanted to explore it for sure. And I'm never one, you know, I'm not a really good filmmaker in the vein of, you know, doing a budget and making a plan and, you know, reaching out and crowdfunding and yeah. doing all the things you're supposed to do as a filmmaker and thus satisfy your tax people later on, which I'm having a little battle with. But yeah, I, I go in cameras rolling, you know, and, and then figure it out later. I think probably my strongest suit is that I immerse myself in the process and, and I get good access. I get trust with my subjects. Mm. I kind of fall in love with all my different film subjects. You know, they're all still a part of my life. That's what uh, brings the story because they're not afraid to tell me the story, you yeah. know? And I think by by having a little bit of a body of work, they can look at my work and know that there's not going to be a, an exploitation. There's not going to be a bad way to tell it, you know, through my eyes, because I just like I like humor and quirkiness. And, you know, I saw Mrs. Vera's day book and I was just like, yeah, this is the check, check, you know. So, yeah, it, it comes. But you asked if there was something unexpected. You know, I, I would have to say the players in the Vera sphere were unexpected. How wonderful they were. They ended up collaborating with us. Mm. You know, one of the Vera sphere members did, did our poster art, uh, Michael Works. His husband, Andy Cowett and Stephen Clark are tech guys, but they're also one of them's members of a band. Another scored an, uh, a you know, plays and, and short films and things. And they did the, the um, original music. And Ruby Reiki did photographs for our website. Um, you know, so the Verisphere was very involved and getting to know them was the surprise and, and wonderment. And, you know, I think my favorite part, one of my favorite parts is when Michael and David would bring all the costumes from Treasure Island and, you know, fill the, the basement. They don't even do it that way anymore, but this was kind of the standard for a long time. And people would come over and, you know, and not really know what they were going to wear. And so the try-ons, and they're very intuitive and wonderful. They're like, ooh, I know this giant birdcage hat that will go with that, <laughs> with that, that tiki magazine dress that you're wearing. And well, no, let's add a hoop skirt to it, you know, yeah. a giant, you know, whatever. And I, I also love that one, one of the times the outfitting was going on, a woman was walking by and she just, she said, what's going on here? And we brought her in and she ended up getting dressed and marched with them and yeah, nice. off the street, you know, <laughs> and I don't think that's the first time that's happened to them, but I got to witness it and it was, it was glorious. It's that kind of synergy I love, like the, the way that I was so thrilled that Stephen Clark and Andy Cowett and Michael Words were, were involved. And yeah. In because that's what I do. I mean, yeah, I love that kind of community aspect. No one expects anything. And it, it just flows beautifully, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. super rewarding as an artist to, to do something that gets a strong response from yeah. people who aren't even expecting, an, a, you know, an art experience or whatever. It's just... um. It's just people are really intrigued and curious about it. And 
you know, a certain type of people, they just love it when they see it. It makes them very happy that that kind of inexplicable overindulgence or whatever you want to call it um, exists. Um, so it's, it's, it's great. I mean, we've had that with the photos and when we do it, do it live. And it's, it's a very rewarding. I, a lot of artists, you know, it, it's hard enough to get a response, um, but the response we get is almost universally so positive. Yeah, it's great. And with the film too, which we're thrilled about. Yeah. The yeah. film's gotten, you know, we haven't had a bad review and I'm pretty excited <laughs> about that. I'm curious at some point, cause you guys are still doing this artistry and you guys are just keep on keeping it going. Does that fulfillment, I don't want to say SERP the day book, but because the day book was important for the aspect of documenting this, just because you didn't know if you were going to have a next day. Now that you, you guys have, gone through this period of time and have gone and evolved is it has it evolved beyond the day book for you i it has definitely and we've actually discussed this i mean we have thousands of photographs but it was as you say it was a separate thing it was about yeah uh, you know this the isolation the psyche and you know the things that keep us away and yeah the effects of illness and you know as things moved along it started with three four people came with us suddenly it was five six people and then all of a sudden it was 20 and I thought, let's just roll with this. But we have really, I don't, we haven't done a Vera shoot in quite some time because mm -hmm. the collective, that's Vera. I mean, that's the, the yeah. Vera sphere. The collective is it. And that's the beautiful energy that I always wanted to see. But um, up to, to update you, I'm feeling my age and we've been doing this for years. And what was nice is um, some of the other people, I can say younger, can't I? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's my. They stepped forward. I got to check everything now. Um, <laughs> they stepped forward and said, Michael, we hope you don't take it the wrong way, but you know, I'd like to run one of your workshops for you next year. Oh, uh, nice. And, uh, I said, That's great. You know, we've been waiting because it is hard. And also, as Robert said, the, the way this is amazing how this was shot because <clears throat> we don't have that garage anymore, you know, and it's harder to get things done. But yeah. Definitely, in my mind, we even discussed it. I was like, you know, I don't think the Daybook series is over, but to me, the yeah. Daybook is the Daybook, and then the Vera Sphere is another kind of Daybook. Yeah. yeah. And, and our, um, you know, our people could see that it was taking a lot out of us. So they yeah. were, they, they've been looking for a, a way to do it. And, and in a way, having the, the movie, it was a real game changer because, you know, we always doubted that the story would be told. Mrs. Vera's Daybook. The story of two queer artists and the costumes that followed. It lets us consider, you know, what could be next as different. We don't like to just repeat ourselves incessantly. So um, it's been great for that. It's created a little more um, mental space in our, in our lives that lets us continue, you know, pushing forward what we've been working on. And in a way, the book, is, you know, I mean, metaphorically, the book is sort of like a snapshot of like a state of mind, a way of being, the passage of time. And it, it would be inevitable that, you know, for me, that we didn't go out. I mean, that we were yeah. going a group thing because it's about energy. It's always been about energy for me. How often do you guys go back and look at the book? Not that much, actually, do we? I look at them all the time because of the, you know, handling the photos. It's just right, it's right, a, right. a part of our life, you know, it's, yeah. it's like you get just, um, you know, certain ones come in and it's, out. It's, of, it's the thing you bring out at dinner time, you know, if so you've met a new person, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, we're really modest. We don't like, we don't get around talking about what it means. I mean, we're surprised when we get the photos back, I'm as surprised as anyone as to how interesting they are, you know? Yeah. And, and they're my fault, you know, it's like, <laughs> I blame but, you. But, it's, uh, but I'm still, again, it's like when Robert says the hands, the hair stands up on the back of your neck, you know, you're doing it right. You know, that's how we feel with the photos. It's like, there's something here and let's, let's see if we can capture it. You guys touch on it a little bit and you've touched on it in this interview. How has the younger demographic of the LGBT community uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, looked at this? Have you, have they kind of, asked you if they could be, what are you doing next? Can we be a part of it? Have you felt like, has that part of the community, because that's the next generation, that's the next, that's the next evolution 
uh, of our society, you know, getting better is from the younger generation. Has that been encouraging at all? Or how do you feel about the younger generation t- taking this mantle and moving it forward? I'm thrilled because <clears throat> if, if I'd been uh, the age some of them are and I'd seen something of what we're doing, I'd go, wow, what is that? <laughs> the insecure side of me would go, oh, I don't think I could do that. And the other yeah. side says, hey, this is really interesting. But we did a couple of lectures here and there in uh, California, uh, CCAC. And it was very interesting. Not only do we have younger, we have so many. In those costumes, you can't really tell who's who for the most part. We have transgender. Uh, we have younger people. I made an effort as a 68-year-old to bring in some of my peers because a lot of my peers, guys usually, uh, you know, their, their world has not been, you know, probably doesn't madcap. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they'd say things about it. I go, well, we'll dress you. Come on, we'll, we'll dress you. And that, for me, is is the kind of uh, intergenerational thing that I really like because the stigma of HIV really affected our community at so many levels. Yeah. Especially younger people, older people. Yeah, I think uh, the, our group resonates for a certain type of younger uh, gay or non-binary person because the the orientation gender age it's indistinguishable yeah in our group if if you're a transgendered person and used to all this like attention that people focus on your transgenderism here you are just in a group where that that just doesn't matter nobody's even thinking about any of the stuff that you have to carry around with you every, every day and a lot of younger people i think um, they have a different relationship to the, the parade than we do in that they're they're angry and rightfully so. And they want, you know, they want less corporate. They want what they want. And it's not yeah. necessarily what our generation wants. And it's it's sort of their time. Um, but I still like to have that presence, that, you know, in the parade that it, it can still be a parade and it should be what, what you make it. It shouldn't be what other people tell you tell you to do we have met a lot of really young people and it's a real honor that they want to hang out with all these old fogies and the thing they all have in common is an enthusiasm to look really really crazy and that expresses something from within that i think Mm. uh, unifies the whole group and we've had uh people come in um who we see our jackets or see what we do and one of my favorite things was last year when oh about six students who had seen some of the things and told their friends, showed up in their own costumes and were so into it. And we had another, we had a uh, F to M transgender who wanted to be in the parade and had had top surgery and didn't want to wear anything here. What was so great is that he said later, I just felt like myself. I didn't feel categorized or pigeonholed. And it's like, well, that's because we look like the perfect aliens. <laughs> year by year, more and more friends have joined us and now it's just you know an enormous parade of our own basically and it's been really inspiring to watch michael and david adapt and evolve to the growing group well in regards to the film i've been interviewed by a lot of young people Um, i've talked to a lot of young people in audiences and What I'm most happy about is that we're able to talk about a dark period of history with a story that doesn't stay dark. Yeah. If you if you want to find out about the AIDS crisis, there is certainly tear jerking documentaries to be found and they're all valid and they all tell the story. But we just tell it in a different way. Our story is about two people that that made it. Not everyone did. What's great about it is as far as the activism is is it's not an aids film you know it's it's a film about their experience through the aids crisis and they both happen to be involved in historic activism david was in new york and um, involved with his partner at the time in act up and michael actually made panels and led workshops on how to make panels for the names project which I always knew as the AIDS quilt at the March on Washington. I think, you know, you asked a question earlier about what struck me and I'm like, you know, I was absent, you know, you know, thanks to drugs and alcohol, I don't really remember the 1980s. And um, then I got recovery in the early nineties. And so they got to tell the story that I missed. They got to, they got to fight the battles that I didn't, you know, for that, I'm very grateful. And like, 
other reviewers have said we're probably the happiest AIDS film that people are going to see out there. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty audacious to make an AIDS film with a happy ending, but I think that's what Robert did. You know, I think, you know, one of the experiences we have with people who have just seen the film, especially from our generation, is that, you know, you know, you get the sense that it helps them lay to rest some, some yeah. ghosts they've been, you know, carrying around because it shows like, yeah, you, you don't have to remember the, the tragic loss um, as being the defining element of the person who you're missing. Um, you know, you want to remember them for what you loved about them. And I think yeah. the film really opens that door for people um, while not minimizing what caregivers and people with the disease itself um, had to go through. And I can honestly say, I mean, I, I was well into having HIV since maybe 81, and we met in 90, what, two, three. Um, I had been through, I mean, for all the light and funny, hilarious things, there is so much darkness, the shadows and light, there's so much darkness, mm -hmm. uh, so much unhappiness. My writing was very sober, and, and I was just this young person trying to figure out at the time, what the heck is this? that's going on and how do I creatively work with it meanwhile helping people to pass on or seeing them go blind or what have you and I nearly died four times to move from that into what we do it was the only way yeah, we have a gentle punk aesthetic I think that it's just not very typical you know yeah. we're not it, our art we go to some lengths to not be political because we don't want to exclude anyone so it's just it's just about other kinds of characteristics you guys have been independent artists for a very long time what does that mean to you what does it mean to be an independent artist what do you love about being independent you know for, for me it's um the way we've been fortunate enough to, to end up is um that we've just had so much control over our yeah. work if we had gone through like the, the traditional gallery route the people who own it the people that buy it they all have interests and wants and needs and it's an investment kind of world and and that's fine, but that, that was never what called us to, to make art. Yeah, well, you know, it's really funny because even in, in school when I was like 11 and 12, I was drawing little reading cards for people and just giving yeah. them reading. I was, you know, later on painting rocks and writing things on the back and leaving them up where people would find them. So the, the independence is there. No one said you can or can't do that. And I didn't go through formal training, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a fast learner. <laughs> and the independence for me was I've done everything from really bad home movies to really kind of treacherous uh, puppet work and <laughs> work with always working with people. So I, I look at that, that perspective and I go, okay, here's the independent artist. And then I go into the names project. <clears throat> and again, I'm still doing what I want to do, but involving people, freedom is what it says to me. I mean, financially, not so much, but we have freedom. Oh, being an independent filmmaker, you know, it's great. My husband's older than me and we like to travel. I like to cook. I've got a dog. I've got a recovery program, you know, so I don't just make films and I want to do it when I have time. And I've got a, a part-time crew and I don't want anybody, I don't really want to hear anybody else's opinion uh, <laughs> about, you know, where to, you know, place this part of the film in yeah. the part. And, you know, I trust my crew. I value their opinion. They get creative, you know, license to, to help me. And, you know, we're tight and we, and we do our stuff when we have time. And I, I'm not on a time limit. I'm not on restrictions. We don't have out, input from others much unless we ask for it. There does come a time when we do test audiences and things sure. like that. Uh, but and ask for yeah you ultimately want somebody to see it <laughs> well, of course of course but in the filmmaking process you know i don't i, I really don't want to hear like michael said it's freedom and you know we don't get to outside investors yet you know, this this film put me a little bit on the map and i've got other things that are happening right now and i'm like nice. oh my who's gonna you know we might have to hire more people you know we've got you know who's gonna start Who's going to start dipping their, you know, their opinions and their and their agendas into my my work? And yeah. About the time that starts, I'll we'll just plan a trip somewhere. We'll just. <laughs> <laughs>